right, thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, um, I am not going to read the bios that are very carefully uh, spelled out here on these pages. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, I'm not even going to read any of them. But uh, I am going to talk a little personally about each of the writers um, because I think they're fantastic, interesting um, contributors to this event. And I'd like to encourage everyone to look up these writers online. Each of them has a very strong online presence. And you can read a lot of what they've written online. You can see where the, what they do. And you can see where they teach. You can see all the different projects that they do. Um, and um, Tom Beller uh, uh, teaches at Tulane. And he's written three books. Uh, but he uh, also has a website called Mr. Beller's Neighborhood. And it's all uh, stories of many, many kinds about New York. And he's a great chronicler of the city. And it's, it's a public uh, place, so people can contribute um, about New York. And he's uh, put, put some of these pieces together in two different anthologies. Um, he was uh, an editor for 20 years of uh, Open, I'm sorry, Open, Open City, which published a book of Jerry Badanis's poems. Um, Danny Shapiro uh, was a student of Jerry's at Sarah Lawrence, and uh, where she was also a student of Grace Paley's, and she's talked and written a lot about that relationship. Uh, Danny has written two wonderful best-selling memoirs and a number of novels, and she teaches a lot, and she's uh, she has a very active blog, and she writes wonderfully about memoir, and she teaches courses on memoir. She told me that she's teaching one at uh, Kripalu uh, on Mother's Day. So if anybody is interested in that, that I think I'd like to take that. Um, and Maud Newton is, um, Maud Newton in 2002, she was hungry for literary company and so she started a blog for people who are interested in books. And uh, if anybody hasn't gone to her blog yet, I would really encourage it. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people have gone to her blog in these many years. And she has written widely. She's a critic. She, uh, she's written for dozens and dozens of publications. She writes regularly for the New York Times Magazine about books. Uh, she won the Narrative Magazine Novel in Progress Award for a novel that she's writing. And among her other um, accomplishments, I know she's a little ambivalent about this, but there it is. She has 152,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> <laughs> and when you start reading her work, you'll know why. Uh, so I do encourage you to, to look at these writers uh, online because you'll learn a lot more about them and you'll be able to stay in touch with them. And it won't just be tonight, it won't be a one minute scene. <laughs> um, the other writer I want to introduce tonight is Jerome Badanis who is, uh, th this event came about because I was talking to Noreen about doing an event about, inspired by Mentors, Muses, and Monsters, and at the same time, my dear friend Gail Kin was talking about having a closet full of her late husband's books. And Jerry's the author of this, uh, somebody called it a cult novel. Um, it's called The Final Opus of Leon Solomon. It came out in 1989. 1988? 1990. 1990, I'm sorry. And, um, and she was talking, I think, to Danny Shapiro about how she could give out these books and of having some kind of event. And we put our heads together and our mailing list together, and Noreen participated. And, um, and so here we are. And so there are copies of Jerry's wonderful novel for free in the back. And uh, I think it's important to um, carry on his message and his, his art. And Danny and Tom Beller will be talking about w what studying with Jerry meant. And um, I know Gail because of Jerry. I met Jerry at uh, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, like in about 1988. And uh, among the gifts that Jerry gave me was the gift of the room where he lived, where I lived after he lived for 14 years. So I thought about him every day. Um, and I just, uh, to sort of set the tone, probably uh, some, there's, I know there's some friends in, uh, of Jerry's here and some students, um, and then there are probably some people who don't know anything about Jerry. 
but um, I want to just read the very beginning of his novel as a way of setting the stage. Uh, and this is the story of a, uh, a scholar who is caught stealing papers from a library and goes to a rundown hotel to kill himself. And this is the, the story of his life. Uh, and he's, he goes to, to a, a hotel to kill himself. And this is the story he writes. And among his uh, other, uh, among his um, characteristics is that he's a Holocaust survivor and a scholar. And the opening of the book is, uh, begins late evening the second day. There is a metaphysical law, and you can depend on metaphysical laws, that unity is a figment of the imagination. As soon as a unity is slowly, bloodily forged, it has already started breaking down. And right in the bitter heart of the breaking down, a new unity is already being dreamed up in the darkness. You could say that this law describes my life. So on that note, would the panel please come up between us? And we'll talk. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is Maude at the end, Danny and Tom. Um, I think what I'd like to do is ask Danny and Tom to talk for a few minutes each about Jerry and what Jerry meant to them as a mentor and what, what he meant specifically, uh, if there were key, a key moment that changed you as, as an aspiring writer. Danny. I must say that starting, starting with reading from the opening of the final opus, I was sitting there pretty much I'm completely furnished now. Um, if I can say that at an event that has anything to do with Jerry, but because I, I could have quoted it to you and I haven't I haven't read those that that opening in at least ten years, but I was I was speaking in my mind along with along with you and I could hear Jerry's voice. Um, can everybody hear me? I met Jerry at Sarah Lawrence when <coughs> he was a judge of a contest that I didn't win, um, but I was, I guess, the first runner-up, and he wrote me the loveliest <coughs> consolation kind of note and invited me to lunch and, um, and talked about my work with me in this incredibly serious and um, just generous, generous way. And about halfway through the lunch, we were at Sarah Lawrence in this big dining hall, and something came up about this film that he had, um, that he had made, that he had, he had been the writer for. Uh, the film was called um, Image Before My Eyes, and it was about shtetl life in Poland. Um, and um, I knew the film because part of the footage in the film was uh, my family's footage. My great grand my grandfather had taken my great grandfather back to this shell um, with one of the first movie cameras that there that, that existed, and they had said cottage cottage at the grave of my great great grandfather. Um, mm -hmm. And you know you see this footage, and it's a grave that no longer exists. It was pre-war Poland, and Jerry. He just leaned over the table and he looked at me and he said, you're the Shapiro footage? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and there was something about that, you know, that, that, that bonded us. I think very, I felt that he understood where I came from, uh, perhaps even uh, more deeply than I understood where I came from. And, um, but I was thinking about it today and I was thinking it was the generosity of a working writer whose first novel was about to come out, <coughs> working on his own material, material and had a full course load, taking the time to write a note to a student saying, come have lunch with me, I really think you have a gift and I'd like to talk to you. That just, um, that really stayed with me. That's what I was thinking about today. That, that lasts. That's a gift that lasts. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, 
Um, I just want to volunteer a random fact. This person we're talking about, I don't want to presume anyone knows you know, him personally, although I know that a few people in the room do. Um, he was a professor of mine at Vassar, and uh, he taught a class that was a year-long sort of intro fiction class, which I took in my junior year, having finally capitulated to a fate of being an English major, which I tried to resist. Um, and at the time I took the class, I didn't have any particular idea of myself as a writer. Though when I now think about earlier moments in my life, I think, oh yeah, of course, you know, you're doing this and this. But um, in the course of being his student, I started to kind of warm up to the idea. First, that I might be good at this, and this is sort of fun, and then starting to think more seriously, like, well, what would this entail? And the most immediate example of what it might entail was the guy teaching the class. And um, then I'm sort of looking at him, and he provided a very interesting example uh, of a, you know, the pluses and the minuses. He seemed to be a guy with, uh, not, I wouldn't say time on his hands, but he was, had an unusually autonomous life. And once we became friendly, and this really picked up even more after I was a student, you know, we talked a lot um, and made friends and found a few avenues of mutual, you know, there's a certain genre of friendship I have that is a very, it involves philosophy, sex, food, and basketball. Grouping of interests. And really, Judaism is the unstated connection. <laughs> but uh, Jerry would belong to that. And it was, a novel, it was a novel experience. I want to just throw a couple of random things out there. One is that when this thing came up, I'd been invited to go speak at Vassar, and I'd be back to the Vassar talk with this. So I've just come from a kind of shocking revisitation of the, of the, of the primal banana scene in a funny way. <laughs> and, and Another thing I want to say is, um, as with anyone you're close to who meant something to you, you know, when their death is, is a major thing one has to reckon with. And the thing with Jerry that was interesting for me was, I, my dad had died when I was a very little kid. So Jerry was a very bearish guy, beard, not much of a neck, a kind of, um, he was sort of hugging you even if you were sitting across the table. There was this real feeling of embrace. And uh, not paternal, though, but you know, inevitably being a professor and so forth, and somebody who I looked to for guidance. And the way he died, by the way, I mean the timing, I wanted to share because I don't ever talk about it. And I figure this is the one uh, apropos time to throw this on the table. So it's 1995. and. I've got my first book coming up, and we've had lunch, and the galleys are in my hand, and he's thanked, and we have a wonderful time. And then we leave, and he sees a friend of his, who I actually now really like, for, but what happened with this friend is he goes, this guy was a student of mine, and he looked at this book, it's wonderful, he's done this, and he's done that, and this guy got in my face, he's like, yeah, you think you're hot shit? <laughs> like, after that, what was up with him? I now love this guy because, this is a weird aside, at the funeral between the, the memorial and going to the cemetery, every, all these people stop for gas on 96th Street, and then you pull into that gas station and you have to pull out, and there's all this stuff, and this, this guy, the same like, asshole essentially, was standing, as people were some honking and some confusion, standing there going, it's a funeral! You know, it's a funeral, 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 it's a But, on a darker note, this is the thing. Then, so he got to see the galley, but the book comes out in the, what was then my local bookstore, also his local bookstore, uh, Shakespeare and Company on um, First uh, and Broadway, featured my book. That was like my home team bookstore. They really did a great job at poster in the window. And then he, Jerry died, and the, uh, the surreal thing was they, the window for one Shakespeare and Company was my, the poster of my first book dominating the window with nothing else in it except a copy of Jerry's novel wrapped in a black ribbon. And that juxtaposition was ridiculous. But then here's the thing I never talked about, because it's so crazy, which is, because what do you what do you make of this? But I'm just gonna throw it out there and have move on. He died on May 18th, my dad died on May 18th. That's 
I invited Maude to be on the panel because she wrote an amazing essay about Harry Cruz shortly after he died uh, for the all. And she had a very different relationship with her mentor or this mentor person than you guys had with Jerry, you know, a different category. But I was wondering if you could talk about um, what he meant to you or how you came to feel he was a mentor. He's obviously a very different sort of guy from you. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hard to talk about Harry Cruz without um, making him into a caricature of himself because he was um, an astonishingly opinionated man and really a presence and really um, a kind of southerner who uh, came from a, an extremely poor background and didn't really have much truck with the niceties of um, literary society. He was very serious about his writing. He was very serious about story. Um, he was incredibly passionate about those things. And he was also the kind of guy who would, you know, according to um, legend, and I think there's some substantiation behind it, because it was in the New York Times, he walked across the country to attend a Vermont writers' conference and arrived smelling like a bear. And he, um, not very long before he died, and I, I, if memory serves, he was in his late 70s, he got in a big fight with someone and um, was in the hospital and he did this interview with Vice, which is, you know, pretty colorful stuff. And he was like, you know, man, I had my guts in my hands. You know, that was the kind of guy he was. So, um, so I was, when I took his class, I was terrified of him and also really fascinated by him because he reminded me of some of my Texan relatives who are pretty straight shooting people who also came from um, from poverty and um, and I really liked that about him and I feel in hindsight incredibly lucky that I that I found this person who had these experiences that weren't like my own but because they were just one generation removed from me um, they really I, I connected with them in some way, and and I think you know he had a lot of rules. He had a um, you know I remember him standing at the blackboard shouting that fiction is an action and drawing these um, somewhat incomprehensible diagrams. And, you know I remember <laughs> the first story. I, I think I turned in a story the first week, and everyone else got an F. And I got a C minus. <laughs> he said, I think you'll do well in this class. <laughs> so, you know, he was hardcore and he would, you know, he did not mince words. He was, you know, very line by line, brutally ruthless about what he felt worked, what he felt didn't work. Um, and I think I was. I was afraid of him, but I was also really determined to do the best that I could to impress him. And over the years, I've really carried forward a lot of the things that he um, that he had to say about fiction. I don't agree with all of them, but I I do fundamentally think. I mean, and, and he was quoting Faulkner when he said this, but the fiction that is for him and, and for me as well about the matters of the human heart. And, um, and so that's something I always try to remember. So it's, it's like he, you internalized him, even though... He, he, I did. I mean, weirdly, he's, he really had quite a bit in common with my grandmother, which is a strange <laughs> thing to say. But um, she was just this very salty, you know, um, larger than life Texan woman and um, in some ways at the best of times I almost felt like he 
he was this other embodiment of my grandmother teaching me to write. So I had a sort of transferential thing with him, maybe somewhat similar to, to Tom's. Um, so I, I'm kind of interested in the um, idea, so now that we have all this perspective, you know, that you get when you get old, is the, your consolation prize for being old. Um, <laughs> Do you see Jerry differently? Do you, do you see his influence differently now than you saw it then? I mean, do you kind of have you reevaluated him, or do you can you see him as more of a, a person, or did you, or is he still in this sort of godlike? I would say for me, he wasn't godlike then, mm -hmm. and and that was part of the beauty of the relationship is that. Um, he was so human, and he wore it all very, you know, he was, he, he, um, he, he presented himself that way. He was, uh, you know, I love what Tom said about, you know, that, like just being with him was a hug, yeah. but it was also his vulnerability and his appetites and his fears and his everything were very much there when he was uh, with someone that he felt that kind of you know friendship with, and I think, I mean, I would say over the years, and in 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 teaching myself, I guess I had started to teach, by the, by the, you know, in, in, yeah, I started to teach in the early nineties, but having now taught for a long time, um, I think that there are ways in which being that human being in a classroom, um, that 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 is somewhat informed by uh, by Jerry's example in that way, but there's there's something, he, he once said to me, I was thinking about this one point, while I was just speaking to this, he wasn't exacting on a sentence level as a teacher, like that, that wasn't his thing. Sentences weren't his thing. I mean, they were his thing as a writer, but they weren't his thing as a teacher. Uh, but I remember once he saying to me in a workshop, you know how to write a beautiful sentence, you just really need to make sure it means and that has stayed with me. It's become one of my governing principles. I mean, oh, this is pretty. You know, this, has, this sounds poetic. This has lyricism to it. What does it mean? Am I actually... You know, so so um, that, that, that feeling, I think, of a, of a, a great teacher or a great mentor is that their words continue to echo. I really occasionally, and especially now, I'm writing a book about writing right now. Um, I've got to find a way of saying that without saying writing three times in one sentence. But I, I just finished this, this book that is about the creative process. And I, 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 I do sometimes really hear Jerry's voice uh, um, in, in, in that way. And I actually included that example in the book of, mm -hmm. of, of that, that kind of wisdom that just stays with you and keeps on transforming itself as one transforms as a writer, as one matures as a Well, I'll certainly echo uh, what Danny said, that this, that the Danis was somebody you could feel, um, not that you were a peer with him, but the dynamic was not uh, parental. That said, I feel like the process I've gone through with him, and this was already underway just by virtue of getting out of college and so forth, but is one that mimics the parental dynamic, where as you get older, you start to realize what it is your parents went through, and sort of almost even make space to think about what their life was like. And in Jerry's case, um, I want to just jump into a very specific argument he and I had that was concerned with the Mr. Softy Trucks jingle, that nice little sound <laughs> in the ice cream truck. And I thought that the Mr. Softy Truck jingle was a happy summer sound, the rainbow sprinkles. And he said, <laughs> that he had the complete different association of a clown being slowly murdered. <laughs> and the reason that stayed with me is because, as it was a passing detail at the time, but I was like, well, wh where were you? You know, let's talk context here. And Medanis is a guy who was very interested in poetry and literature, but was then diverted his energies into being an anti-war activist, and that itself took of the form of street theater, which is a, a kind of discipline that to my ears now is like 
kabuki seems more familiar to me than what street political street theater might be. But I was able to get a sense of that for him. And uh, but then, you know, felt very disillusioned with the anti-war effort and found himself as a superintendent of a crummy building on the Lower East Side in the early 70s in the basement trying to write while the Mr. Softy truck came by. So that may have also influenced the feeling, but I, it's a little meaningful to me in the sense that as a professor, you're just like, almost like a parent, you're like, well, they're, they're just they're, they're, they're running the class. And you're the kid whose needs are being met or not, or you're pissed or you're happy. But then gradually, I've come to understand the context of Jerry's career, and having just gone to Vassar, really struck me, because now I'm involved in academia myself, and it's curious. And but Dennis was like a he was like a one man insurgency at Vassar College, which was a very <laughs> uptight, um, sort of anal retentive, psychically <coughs> anal retentive space at the at the professorial level. <coughs> and Dennis was somebody whose interests ranged from urbanism to Jewish history to Shakespeare to literature, poetry, the beats, jazz, and he kept getting gigs teaching actually these in these different departments and. It, the, the school started to feel antagonized by this guy who doesn't have a PhD and has not been let into the front door. It's like he's not really invited, but he keeps being at the party. And there was at some point where the chairman of this department and the dean and the president were like, enough with Bidanis in the English department. And then, like, whack a mole, he popped up in like urban studies teaching him, <laughs> bringing him around. But what happened with me was this junior year experience that was so galvanizing and as a, for me as a writer. Um, was followed by the next year. He was told that he was going to be fired once and for all, that's it. And the deliverer of this news was like a, almost like a James Bond level on sympathetic <laughs> character, like a villain, you know. Because he, he was a very um, repressed sort of Boston Brahmin character who came from a long line of, um, you know, sugar. It's a, it's a sugar business thing, so <laughs> it's really just some horrible things were happening in the Caribbean under this family's crest, you know, 200 years ago. And now he's a medievalist at this genteel institution. But he was the one that lowered the boom on Jerry, and I took it upon myself, and I'll, I'll stop. But I wanted, it was just there, to antagonize on Jerry's behalf. And I went and sat in this guy Purse's office. And the sad part of the story is I like to think that he was like completely vanquished, but actually he went on to run the Morgan Library for 25 years, so he was just fine. <laughs> but, I did feel like he was not used to getting fucked with, if you could forgive that language. And I'll never forget sitting in his office in, in as calm way as possible saying, you know, Jerry Bananas has offered a lot to the students of this school, and that ought to be taken into consideration because, for example, and then, yes, well, da -da -da, and I, I just wouldn't leave. And he's one of these guys with these incredible shoes, like the burnished brown of that letter was like, I don't know how much they cost, how often they were shined, nice suits, you know. His legs were crossed. Listening, at some point that leg started bobbing, that foot started moving, like a little pendular up and down. And I thought, this either means I'm making progress or I'm making him unhappy. Either way, it's good. But, and <laughs> none of this was, it was all a pyrrhic sense of triumph. But, you know, I did then write an uh, editorial in the newspaper that calmly laid out the case for Jerry. And I'll just, I'll just, I'll stop. I can't stop. I'm going to be really quick for this next part. End of story. Jerry's gone from Vassar. The purse guy also left, not because of my agitation, although it was suggested today that maybe I, I discolored his sense of control over his exit, that it was something that was a draft. He was being kind of screwed up. And I, this almost brings me to Danny's experience with him, because at that moment, he seemed really vulnerable in the world. Uh, as Danny said, he was always very vulnerable as a person. That was one of the interesting things about him, that he was willing to put that out there if he felt you were his friend. But now all of a sudden he doesn't have a job, what's going to happen? And then this little, most ludicrously wonderful series of events happened in which Grace Paley sort of anointed him just on the sound of hearing him read. You know, it was a, she heard his voice reading from, I assume, the book and was like, this is the guy that's going to succeed me at Sarah Lawrence to take over this program. Just from an oral experience. It, you know, it wasn't about reputation or review. But the other thing that happened was when the book came out, Got a very good review in the Times Book Review. You don't want to make too much, you don't want to give too much authority to a book review. But I remember reading that review, and my disposition was generally like, good things get sort of screwed over and trash gets rewarded. Not an opinion that I've been led to completely overturn by anything that's happened since, but that seemed to be the rule, you know? 
and I'd read the, the Danis novel, and I thought it was incredible, and so dirty, by the way, so much sex in that book, I can't believe it, and just, but very redeemed in a strange way. But this review was unbelievably on the money, got the book, said the right thing, selling review, and it just, it was a bit Danis like epiphany, like justice is possible. Like, <laughs>